Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Tabard Inn, new American cuisine in one of Washington, D.C.'s oldest hotels, located in DuPont Circle. For more information, visit tabardinn.com. This episode is brought to you by Route 11 Potato Chips. Made with a secret recipe and superior ingredients, their mission is to make an outstanding product in a safe and clean environment. To learn more, visit rt11.com. Hey, hey, welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. I'm Jimmy Carboni, I'm the host, and we're here on the Heritage Radio Network. We'll be talking about Craft Malt Week and um, all more about this wonderful world of craft beer. And Mr. Brent, would you introduce yourself, please? Yes, hey, I'm Brent Manning. I am co-founder of Riverbend Malt House in Asheville, North Carolina, and also one of the co-founders of the North American Craft Maltsters Guild. All right, so... For our listeners, uh, going back about a year and a half ago, we got connected um, through some folk with the Craft Malt- Maltsters Guild, and we've done some pretty in-depth shows about craft malt, more, more than we ever have uh, in the last year and a half, and uh, we have talked to Brent before. So it's a special opportunity to talk to him. Uh, craft Malt Week is coming up in September, September 11th to 17th, and um, Brent's going through some expansion. So we're going to have a one-on-one talk talk with this uh, champion and pioneer of, of craft malt. So Brad, for our listeners, and just to refresh everyone, how'd you get started in craft malt? Uh, yeah, so it, the, the story goes back, uh, myself and co-founder Brian Simpson, uh, we used to be environmental consultants uh, on the coast of North Carolina uh, in early 2000s. And when the housing market collapsed, we, we quickly found ourselves kind of looking for encore careers. And uh, we were both really into the outdoors and wanted to move our families up to Asheville and uh you know, quickly just discovered, oh man, we're, we're going to have to re- reinvent ourselves here professionally. And uh, I was a home brewer, loved craft beer. Um, but, you know, at the time we thought Asheville had enough breweries. So we, we started looking into the supply chain piece because we're uh, sustainability geeks. Uh, we had done biodiesel together and uh, just really really started looking at that. Uh, hops didn't work uh, for a variety of reasons. We didn't own any land uh, for starters. Uh, and then when we started talking about small grains, the conversation got a lot more interesting because of the amount of existing acreage and infrastructure and research uh, available to us in the, in the Southeast. So uh, we started working with Ag Extension, found some growers that wanted to grow some barley with us. And we planted our first crop under contract uh, back in 2010 and made our first batch of malt in early 2011 or late 2011, uh, a whopping 1,800 uh, pound batch. So, wow. And uh, been growing steadily since. Did you think at that time, did you feel that you said that you thought North Carolina was ripe for it? Do you feel like that the conditions in North Carolina were, were ahead of other parts of the country? 
Um, I don't know if it was that or it, you, what felt right was, was the sourcing piece of it. This is, you know, connecting the, the farmer to the craft beer uh, movement. And it, we knew that, like, it, you know, there was so much focus on local food in Western North Carolina and all of that connective tissue and interest and the energy around that we thought, how perfect. Let's just find barley grown in this region and we'll put that into this craft beer that everyone's going crazy for. And, uh, you know, this is before Sierra Nevada, New Belgium, Oscar Blues, uh, you know, announced their East Coast expansions. It, this was really even before the the South Slope and downtown was a thing. I mean, this was, you know, early days in Asheville, but there was still this just really exciting energy in the space. And we, we thought, this was the way to, to enhance that. Oh, you, sh- you sure did. So the, so back to the sourcing and the farmer. I mean, o- often you think about, I remember Pete Brown was talking about, I think it was Miracle Brews, he was talking about the ingredients. And for years, I think a lot of people would think that beer was made of chemicals, and we know it's not. But even when you think about craft malt, you think about shopping, you think about dialing up a chocolate malt or a specialty malt. But I want, I want to hear about one or two early relationships with, with a farmer or farming family that really made a difference for you and maybe some of the trials and tribulations when you were getting started. Because I'm sure, how, how could they believe in you? I mean, there weren't that many people asking for, you know, malt quality barley then, were they? No, no. I mean, we I, I visited many a farm in the early days where, you know, a farmer would point to a, a pile of uh, feed barley dumped in the corner of a <laughs> barn and just say, you know, how's that look to you? And I said, not great. That That's not what I'm looking for. And, uh, you know, so it, there were a, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, conversations about quality and, and uh, you know, cleaning, storage, et cetera. A lot of heartburn moments there. Um, y- you know, but a couple of stories that come to mind. Uh, you know, we started out so green, uh, figuratively and literally. Uh, you know, everything was organic and everything, you know, w- was so close to home. And then early on in, in 2000 uh, or 2012, I think, we had a really uh, just terrible crop year and the organic barley was was just awful. And uh, a man by the name of Billy Dawson came to see us and he said, guys, I, I know you're organic, but take a look at this conventionally grown thoroughbred six row barley that came off my farm. And it, it was just gleaming, golden, perfect, beautiful barley. And we're like, all right, well, if it's the choice of closing up shop or working with Billy Dawson, we're, we're going to go down this road with Billy and see what happens. And, uh, you know, that, that really beautiful barley also helped us make better malt. And uh, that, that was a, a huge moment for us that uh, we were like, okay, specs just improved. And this is right about the time that, you know, the mixed culture movement in, craft, in the craft beer space was starting to percolate and, People were sort of looking for that sort of rustic malt that was a, a taste of place to augment their, you know, spontaneous uh, projects and all of that. And here comes Riverbend with a locally sourced uh, six-row Pilsner malt, and it was just perfect timing. And things just went up from there. Well, what was one of the first beers of note that, that was made with your malt? You know, um, oh, geez, let's see. I one of the early that was a ones long, that comes a long time mind. ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, there, there are early days. Like you know, I, I think one of the earliest one was just called Riverbend Brown with uh, Pisgah Brewing Company in Black Mountain, and then uh, uh, Burial had a rye IPA with our malted rye that was you know back when they were on like a one and a half barrel system in the early early days. You know, uh, they'd call us and you know we'd mill like partial bags for them and stuff like that. So it, it was, it was, it was pretty crazy back in those, you know, early days. We, we kind of envisioned ourselves like the, the milkman, you know, it's up with malt, you know, that we would just load up the truck and make deliveries out to the breweries in town and come back and rake the malt or clean a batch or start a kiln run or something. And it, we weren't far off in those early days, honestly. I mean, it was just trying to figure things out. Oh yeah, 
You know, it's amazing how, how it's changed. I, I was thinking of, of a list of, you know, the monsters that I know and, and certain breweries that work with them. And um, I know you're going to tell me about a beer that you're drinking, but I want to go through some of the Northeast ones I know. Like a big surprise, which it wasn't a surprise, but just from the time I've known Craft Mall is about eight years. And Industrial mm-hmm. Arts uh, with Jeff O'Neill, as they've grown, they, they do some specific series um, with with locally grown ingredients, and I, I feel like I'm. I, I think I'm going to talk about the how it's craft malt has grown and the fact that the craft malt week is coming up in September. Um, just to see like a great brewer like Jeff O'Neill and Industrial Arts and have dedicated lines of beer that that that, that showcase local ingredients. Um, are you seeing that across the country? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think what's been really fun to see is, you know, we try to pull brewers out of a plug and play uh, mindset and and get them to kind of start with the malt, the flavor profiles that, that they pick up from the hot steep uh, assessments, you know, kind of get instead of like taking a flagship beer and taking out a, a major component that, that's driving that flavor profile and replacing it with something different, you know, it might be a win, it might not. And uh, so, you know, for us, it, at least speaking for Riverman, you know, we, we try to invite customers to kind of, you know, crawl before they walk and make a, a seasonal or a one-off. And then as they settle in with it and then we can talk about migrating into a flagship and uh so but yeah i, I think uh, from coast to coast we're, we're seeing folks i mean um you know i know our friends at admiral out in uh, alameda you know their pilsner malt has done uh phenomenal things uh, that i think is it is it trimmer brewing or or there there's a pilsner that's just absolutely crushed it with their malt this one at gabf and world beer cup in in the last 18 months and so you know getting some recognition like that you know seeing rabbit hill in new jersey work with uh the seed uh project there and the recognition that those folks have gotten um you, you know it you know, we've got a great list here with folks like um, we've got, you know, Fauna Flora and, um, you know, pretty much everybody in the South Slope is doing some pretty amazing things on, you know, not only just mixed culture, but we're going into lagers. We're finding homes in IPAs now. So it's that that's been really fun to see that, you know, is when we we can we can play in the specialty one-offs, but then when we can also get the green light because of our consistency to make it into an IPA that's on the grocery store shelves, you know, there there's a different kind of of pride that comes with that, you know. Oh yeah. So let's let's talk a little bit more about the evolution from being a specialty or a one-off malt to being what, what do you call it? If you want to be the primary, it's called primary malt. Or you know, get the, what we would refer to as being your, you know, your base malt contract or something like that. Um, you know, uh, uh, as as beer brewing and styles have evolved, you know, once upon a time, you know, an IPA had pale malt in it, and now a lot of folks use, uh, you know, can oscillate. It could be a Pilsner malt from Canada. It could be Golden Promise from over in the UK. Um, there's almost no crystal malt in the modern IPA recipe. So, start, you know, expectations ha- have really shifted around a fair bit in the last 10 years in terms of what brewers are looking for when they think about the grist of an IPA that, you know, dominates 50 to 60 percent of sales right now. So, but, but, you know, but to answer your question, you know, as as we're going along, you know, I think it's, it's exciting to be recognized early as developing and creating beautiful, unique flavors, but then also to be recognized for making something that's beautiful and unique so consistently that you can deliver large volumes of it into an IPA recipe that is, you know, kind of the the turn and burn recipe for a given brewery in our area. So I I think, because that's kind of a, 
that's just a different step, you know, it, it, you know, being recognized as delivering beautiful, flavorful malt at capacity in a consistent fashion is, is super challenging to get to. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's no joke to, to, to turn over batch after batch of, you know, malt that arrives within a half an SRM in a color spec and, you know, consistently above 81% extract, you know, that kind of stuff doesn't happen by accident. And are you guys now are celebrating what at your 10th harvest? Uh, 11th. That's 11th 22. Now. So oh, yeah, wow. yeah. So pretty wild. Um, yeah, and our growers are a big piece of that consistency. You know, um, er, early on, we we would get you know lots from different growers, and the quality would vary uh, some sometimes tremendously across the state, across the region. And now, as our growers have, have gotten more experience, the the quality is just uniformly better. And so better raw materials makes better finished malt. I mean, it's just that simple. Oh, yeah. No, it's great talking to you about this. And we'll get a little more specific. So we talk a little bit about farms. I want to talk about equipment sure. because um, yes. it all seems, you know, you think of the old days, there was like a, a little oven and, and you know, you're toasting some malt. <laughs> uh, you know, maybe someone's burning the old barrel staves and that's, oh, the, yeah. that's flavor in the malt. Um, you're, you're expanding now and it sounds like you, you kind of outlined just how you've grown uh, with the industry around you but wh what's the new fancy equipment that you got it's I can't even pronounce yeah. it <laughs> so yeah to, sort of, so, to, to paint a picture for, for our listeners so our, our first kiln was constructed out of uh, insulated um, like aluminum panels and it was skinned with uh, a fireproof foam board. And we daisy chained electric heating elements together to one single thermostat and one single blower. <laughs> and it had, it, you know, had absolutely no instrumentation. One of us would have to go in in the middle of the night and make damper changes as we went through free dry, force dry and curing during the kilning stage. And then you know, flash forward to today where we're welcoming our fourth 10 ton GKV or germ kiln vessel into the building. And, you know, this thing stands 20 plus feet tall and is so full of instrumentation that we get a, a full readout every couple of seconds that we can check in on it with our smartphones. And uh, it, so it, it's, it's just been really fascinating to, um, you know, see this evolution. I, I, I always sort of playfully pick on our, our brewer customers. I said, you know, if you guys want to open a brewery, you just put the word out at a place like CBC and you could have half a dozen engineers uh, show up on your door and help you lay out the space for maximum efficiency and all of that. And, you know, Craft Malt just didn't have that at all. <laughs> I mean, it was it was either, you know, either you were in the market for something that was like a research size, like chest freezer. Um, like they called it a Joe White maltings. It was like a test malting thing that would do 500 grams of a bunch of different samples in a uniform fashion. Obviously, 500 grams doesn't do much for us if we're trying to make commercial scale batches of beer. So... You were either at the Joe White malting scale or you were at something like, you know, it starting at 50 to 100 times and there was nothing in between. So that, that's why you see a lot of the, the early craft maltsters were, you know, truly DIYing kiln design using an old textbook called Malt and Malting that had some basic engineering uh, information in it regarding airflow and BTUs and such for heat. And, uh, you know, it, it's been really wild to, to see that evolution. Um, you know, much like craft beer, craft uh, malt brings people in from a lot of different backgrounds and skill sets. And so it's super fun just to see how people's skills, you know, turn into innovation. You know, when we hear about craft malt, there's that image of the floor malting and the, the hardworking person raking, raking the, the malt. Um, what's the technology of that? <laughs> and how, how, how far away is that from your, your new machine? 
So the the technology, and we still floor malt too. I mean that that that's baked into our DNA. We're we're not going to turn that loose. But you know uh, the the technology of that, I would say, is, is really more in sort of the the human hand and the human uh, you know sensory experience. I mean that's really what we zero in on. Is you know we use our floor malt system as a way of teaching and developing new products. So if we have new employees, getting them in there to sort of see, taste, smell, and, and explore the, the grain during that crucial germination stage, you know, that is far more impactful than having them open the, uh, you know, a man way on the 10 ton GKV, you know, where it's just, it's just looks and feels a little bit more industrial. A lot of the same processes are going on, but it's not quite as intimate, you know. And so having that that floor malt uh, experience allows, you know, us to play around with new barley varieties and new crops and make small mistakes. Um, And then also serves as a great training tool to bring our staff up to speed on what healthy germinating barley looks and smells like at each of those crucial stages. So... I guess that's really, it, it makes any sense to call it human technology, but it, that's really how we see it. No, that, that's neat. I mean, it, it's just, like I said, it's it's hard to understand that, that yeah, there's farmers and then there's processes, but it, there's there's something that goes on that, that, that you guys are doing right. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I want to call it magic. I, like old days, you would have called it magic. <laughs> I want to call it magic too, you know, and it, it's, uh, you know, and, and a lot of it too, is, you know, knowing those smells and those tastes and, and, you know, doing the, you know, you know, thumb and forefinger test of rubbing out the, the endosperm and the germinating grain and understanding that at that sort of small scale, two ton level has helped us fine tune the larger batches to get very similar flavor profiles out of the bigger batches. And that, that really, I think it has been super cool. And we even work with the engineers to kind of allow the, the big, the big difference when we talk about floor malting versus pneumatic malting, which is what's happening in the GKVs is, is really the, the rise and fall of temperature and humidity in the grain bed during germination. So in floor malt, kind of imagine it like a sinusoidal wave. You know, it builds up as the grain is germinating, and then you get to that eight-hour point, and the rake comes through, the rootlets break up, the the air exchange occurs, the cool air enters, and it drop the everything kind of cools down for a little bit, and then that all that enzymatic digestive work starts generating heat again, and the process repeats itself over three to five days, and so, you know taking a a little bit of that sort of flow and mapping that into our germination uh, program is, you know, really fun to be able to play with those dynamics and try to match up flavors that way. Wow. Yeah. It's something to talk, to talk more about and, you know, and and in depth Um, right now, I'm just trying to get my head around it. (laughs) And it would be great to taste a couple of beers, you know, this to the same barley with, floor malt versus the i'm sure you do these tests right oh yeah yeah we've only had one customer tell us they can tell the difference between the two products so you know because you know something most all of our current flagship products began life as two-ton batches and we fine-tuned the blending and the timing and the temperatures on the floor and then map that over to the 10 ton and made sure and we did the side by side tastings of the finished malt to make sure we were flavor matching at the larger scale wow man you know and, and now you, you have a role in the craft malt uh, the craft malters guild um tell us a little bit about the craft the craft malt week because they had the craft malt conference which which i've sat in on the last two years and now it's craft malt yeah. week yeah, so we're we're really looking forward to uh, this September. It'll be our third Craft Malt Week. Um, you know, it, it, as is often the case, it began as a day and then spilled over into a week long celebration. And it, it was really conceived as an as an uh, as an opportunity for storytelling and and to let people sort of peek behind the curtain and see what 
is going on uh, in this industry because it, it's, I always tell people, it's like, how far back do you want me to start the story? Do you want me to start when the barley variety began its development 10 years ago? Or do you want me to start when it was planted in October? Or do you want me to just start when we received it in late summer? You know, it's like, so sort of peeling back all those layers and letting people see how much effort goes into making really special locally crafted products and, and the resulting beautiful lagers and ales that, that our brewers put together, um, you know, I think enhances, it enhances people's appreciation. You know, it's easy to get lost in craft beer when you're drinking a fruited sour that's, you know, 20% blackberries and boysenberry puree and whatever. But, but, you know, if you're drinking a beautifully crafted Hellas, you know, that, that's a, it's a little bit easier to draw a tight line of sight between the malt and the story behind all of that. Oh yeah. You know, and the, the last year I've gotten to know more, more of the craft monsters. Uh, we did talk with Ad, Admiral this year, um, but in the Northeast it's, it's, I'm still stuck on like Kent falls in Connecticut and the work they do with, with Valley malt and, um, yep. you know, plan B in the Hudson Valley always works with this really small farmhouse malt and also Hudson Valley malt. But um, wh one that stands out is um, the OEC, which is uh, in Connecticut also. And they use a lot of traditional processes as a brewer, but they work with one farm called Thrall Family Farm uh, for, uh -huh. for their wheat. And I'm, I'm trying to get to the wheat thing. And they're making like a 19th century style wheat. There's a couple of versions. Um, and whenever I see it, I, I grab it. Um, you know, we always talk about barley. I, I don't know what it is. I just know on the can it always says Thrall Family Farms, um, and I'm pretty sure it's the wheat. So they're often the wheat mm -hmm. beer is is using their wheat. Um, but but for you guys, you know, what, what role do the other grains play? Um, you know, we we know that barley. The challenge was barley getting the right varieties of barley to grow, especially in the Northeast. Um, you know, and learn and just learning how to, to malt properly and all that. Sure. Yeah. You know, our, our first challenge was we only had six row barley. So thinner kernels, typically, uh, you know, six row malt was typically associated with macro lagers and, and craft brewers did not want anything to do with it. Um, so that was one big challenge. And then, you know, as we explored some of the other grains that are available, um, you, you know, it, it was exciting challenges all around, you know, working with um, our abruzzi rye, you know, everyone always complains about working with rye. It's a pain to malt. It doesn't have a husk and it, it's just oilier. It can mash down when you're walking on it, raking it. It just creates a lot of extra headaches along the way. Um, but the flavor is just out of this world you know it's just yeah lots of interesting floral uh notes uh you know it, black peppercorn just really pops uh when you compare it with some of the more modern hybrids that that are hitting the market right now um it, you know so but for us you know we, we've done some heirloom wheat we we're we've settled in on a, a couple of uh more recently released soft red winter wheats that you know perform beautifully. I mean, we, we always keep an open line of communication with local uh, bakers and we like to learn what varieties they're into working with. And then kind of, we always figure if the, if the bakers are happy, the brewers will be too. And oh, yeah. uh, that's, largely, that's largely been the case. Um, and, you know, then exciting things like the challenge of, of the hazy IPA craze, you know, how to, you know, as we saw that rising in popularity, we were like, well, I guess we got to figure out how to malt oats and <laughs> where do those come from? And, you know, are they a pain in the butt? And how do we figure out the eccentricities of that? And, uh, you know, we, we've also uh, continued to explore uh, the space of malting corn, which, you know, corn for is a summer crop. So corn likes warmer water when it goes into germination and it, it behaves a little differently during germination typically it takes longer to hit the same level of modification that say a, a modern barley variety would so you know that creates some process scheduling challenges and it, it's um but it's something we're starting to get known for you know as we can make 
uh, large amounts of, of malted corn. It's uniform and, and readily available. So, you know, that's opening doors in, bro- in both the brewing and distilling spaces for us. So that, that's been a fun one. Oh, that's great, man. Hey, we're off to a great start. We're going to be back in a few minutes on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. This episode is brought to you by Tabard Inn. Tabard Inn, Washington, D.C.'s quintessential hotel, is located on a quiet, tree-lined street just five blocks from the White House. Vibrant yet unassuming, the Tabard is comprised of 35 sleeping rooms, each unique in character and design. Feast on an eclectic American cuisine in their acclaimed restaurant, or enjoy a cocktail served on the beautiful patio, which has ample room for social distancing. Travelers from around the world find the Tabard the only place to stay when taking their travels to Washington. For more information, visit tabardin.com. This episode is brought to you by Route 11 Potato Chips. From the moment Route 11 dropped their first batch of chips back in the early days of 1992, they understood their destiny as a high-quality producer. Instead of succumbing to the frenzy of mass production, they took advantage of their small size and made chipping a personal art form. The payoff was immediate, an incredible potato chip. With a secret recipe and superior ingredients, their mission is to make an outstanding product in a safe and clean environment. In this world of uncertainty that we live in, Route 11 potato chips believe comfort food can be just that. Know where your food comes from. To learn more, visit rt11.com. Hey, hey, welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. Support us and become a member at heritageradionetwork.org slash donate. And over 30 podcasts every week. And engineers like Armin Spingen is working with us. And, and several others are, are, are on all these podcasts, giving you great audio quality in the nonprofit Heritage Radio Network.org. So, Brett, um, great conversation. So, you just we brought up corn, and I was just thinking, hmm, I wonder what beers you have in corn. But of course, you mentioned spirits. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that, that's been, uh, you know, you've probably seen the statistics. You, you know, uh, rye whiskey is, is growing. Uh, you know, triple digits year over year, the, uh, you, you know, whether you're big bourbon or craft distilleries, uh, everyone's enjoying this new resurgence of uh, uh, different spirits. And it's really exciting to, to play a role in that. Um, you may have seen that they, they finally sort of standardized the American single malt whiskey category uh, definition now. And I think that's just one more exciting chapter of what's going to happen for uh, craft malt as, as an industry. You know, this it, it's a little limiting to me in the sense that it has to be all barley, but because um, there's, as we just talked about, you know, there's so many other fun grains that, that can be explored in the space, but, but I get it. You, you need to define it. So and, the um, Amer- American single malt has to be all barley. Correct. All malted barley. All malted yep. barley. And, uh, yeah. And so, um, but again, you know, obviously we can do a lot with uh, different uh, specialty development. We can, there's nothing that says they can't blend a, a pale ale and a dark Munich or a Vienna and a Pilsner or whatever. So plenty of space for innovation on that front. And, uh, you know, the the American consumer is, is showing uh plenty of interest in the premium category so that also opens up a lot of uh room to explore as well with you know longer aging and barrel finishes and other fun stuff like that yeah what well, you want to give a shout out to a distiller that's um using one of your malts oh yeah yeah we've got uh our, our buddies here in town uh oak and grist have been making uh an American uh, malt whiskey with our product uh, pretty much since they swung the doors open. And uh, they and they also make an all malt gin with our uh, uh, products as well. And it's really fun to see those releases just uh, continue to flourish and people get more excited about what they're doing. Uh, ASW down in Atlanta is, is uh, got some fun stuff waiting in the wings. Um, Chattanooga whiskey as well. We've got some fun stuff. Uh, a pretty 
look for them. They're going to have a steady cadence of special request malt uh, based products coming out in the months and years ahead. So pretty pumped about that. You said Chattanooga whiskey? Chattanooga whiskey. Yeah, man. All right. Yeah. We used to get a call from them once or twice a year and it's, you know, it, the guy, uh, head guy Grant, will be like, "You ever malted triticale?" And we'll be like, <laughs> uh, "No, but we can try it." And or, "You ever smoked any malt with a barrel or barrel chunks?" And, yeah, sure, we got you, man. You know, so um, yeah, it's it, it's the spirit space has has been really cool to watch it evolve, and and uh, you know the growth is a really eye-popping to see uh, what's happening, both from legacy distilleries uh, as well as those in the craft space. Yeah. Hey, um, I, I, w- I want to you use the word convert in a couple of stories about folks uh, converting to using uh, craft malt. I know you mentioned um, the, the beer you're drinking. Let's, tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. So this, this is a, a really beautiful uh, Pilsner uh, called Pull Tab Pilsner from our friends at Mason Jar Lager Company down in uh, Fuquay, Verena, North Carolina, central part of the state. Um, the, these guys were doing lagers uh, long before the, uh, you know, the before it was cool, I guess you could say. And um, so they're a, a convert in the sense that they were very traditional in their sourcing. You know, if it was a if it was a German style Pilsner, it was going to use German malt. And, uh, you know, in the wake of, of some of these supply chain issues that we're, we're, that we're all wading through right now, you know, we started having some, some in-depth conversations about, you know, what would that look like if we, you know, displaced a, an international product and, and went local, you know, how, would that be a dramatic uh, departure in flavor or would, would I, would they lose efficiency? You know, what would they be giving up if in exchange for that convenience of a local supplier? And, and I'm, I'm really happy to report that, that they didn't have to give up anything. Uh, you know, they actually saw process improvements. Brew day got uh, faster and easier. Efficiency levels even rose a bit and, they were over the moon with the flavor of the finished beer. They, they felt like we stepped in and improved their process and their finished beer. And, uh, you know, that that's just been a, a beautiful thing there to sort of shine a light on both parties through that experience of like, you know, that we can step in and, and compete and win against an, an inter, a, a longstanding international supplier. And uh, that, that's been very gratifying for us at Riverbend. You know, in, in terms of like just other grains, I, I'm, I'm meeting small farmers in the Northeast who are just starting to to mill, you know, heirloom corn for polenta, and they put mm-hmm. they put the the mill date on the package when I get it. Um, I, how important with with malted barley? How important is the date it was malted and and packed? Is 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 that different than just milling, like I said, corn for porridge? Yeah. I- Absolutely. Freshness totally matters. Um, You you know, in the current state of play, what we're hearing is it's about a three month transit time across the Atlantic and, you know, potentially another month getting through uh, customs and getting, you know, from the port to the brewery itself and all of that. You know, on the flip side, you know, we're shipping malt that's probably two to three weeks old, you know, next day after we receive an order. And uh, so that, you know, we're shaving months off of the the time and we get comments all the time from breweries just like, oh my God, we brewed today and it smelled like a bakery in in our, in my brew house. And all of the staff was asking like, what are y'all doing today? Because it smells so different, so much fresher. So always good to see that and you know to see that translate to the freshly packaged beer it, it, you know it again just super gratifying and cool to see that everybody all the way to the bartender is recognizing what's happening well I, i'm i'm i mean for years i've had customers asking about you know a malt you know more malt forward beers but now like i said when I, when i'm when i'm drinking craft malt beers that, that are 
not too hoppy, you know, more of a traditional style. I'm loving it. Uh, my palate's changed a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it, it's been real fun. The, the other probably and I wish I could have shared this experience with with a larger audience. But, you know, as we've been playing around and growing our single origin Pilsner uh, uh, program, you know, at one point, one of our customers downtown, uh, Dissolver, had four different lagers made with four different barley varieties. And to be able to put those side by side and, and talk with Vince, the, the head of operations and brewing there, and really nerd out, you know, about what, you know, what was he liking about the Hirondella versus the Violetta? And, you know, oh, the minute I tasted, you know, we did a project with, um, with Skagit Valley, uh, where we swap barley varieties. And, uh, you know, he just, the minute he tasted the malt, he was like, it's going to be perfect in this style lager. And, you, you know, those types of things, like when we really do get to get down to the brass tacks of like, those individual nuances of flavor. Uh, like I say, I'm not, I'm not ready to, to talk that we're ready to claim terroir, that we can grow the same barley variety on, you know, the east side of the hill versus the west side of the hill, and it tastes different. But <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely in full-throated support that d barley varieties definitely make different flavor profiles in finished malt. I've got, I've got a couple of notes I'm supposed to ask you on that line. 2022 harvest with Avalon barley and Virginia tech. Yes. Yes. Oh, I love the story. Um, so yeah. So, you know, I mentioned ag extension earlier, you know, both in North Carolina at North Carolina state and also at Virginia tech, um, both have public plant breeding programs that deliver newly developed barley and wheat varieties to the public. Um, and this, these programs are necessary for, you know, continuing yield uh, improvement, disease resistance, and a whole host of other factors. Um, early on, when Riverbend was just getting going, we, we sat down with the, the head of the small grains program at um, Virginia Tech, a gentleman named Carl Griffey, and, and his uh, right-hand man, Wincy Brooks. And, you know, it was a wonderful meeting. You know, we're so tiny, you know, making like maybe 100,000 pounds of malt at the time. But, you know, they said, well, what are you looking for from a, 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 a variety? And I said, well, first off, please bring us a two row as soon as you can. Um, and then secondly, we said, you know, there's no number for flavor, but we'd love to have something that's that, you know, really sort of stands out from the crowd like the. The, the hallowed ground of Golden Promise or Maris Otter or something like that. And, you know, and, and they said, well, well, great. Okay, cool. And I, you know, I presented the the craft. This is probably 2012, 2013. I presented all the, the beautiful data of them, of the craft brewing industry growing double digits year over year, and, you know, and, and they're like, okay, well, I think we know, I think we can help you with this guys. And I said, you know, great. How long till we can have a variety? And they're like, oh, it'll, probably take eight. it'll probably take eight to 10 years. And I was like, what? wait, what? I, I just told you this industry is exploding. And the Southeast is like, got the most room for growth of any region in the US. And they're just like, look at me like, this is our process. You know, it just takes time to build a variety that checks all those boxes that you just mentioned and uh so anyway flash forward i'm standing in the field with Wincy brooks in uh you know may at a field day event uh out on the coast of virginia and he, there we stand you know with the beautiful uh, research plot of avalon barley that you know nice plump kernels and everything's looking beautiful and uh, you know, we talk a lot about test weight as a general uh, marker of quality. So a, gen a bushel of barley should weigh about 48 pounds. Um, if it weighs 50 pounds, it's really, really superior quality barley. And uh, so that was one thing they keyed in on during their uh, development of this variety is really driving on test weight, disease resistance, all sorts of stuff. Um, along the way, we got to do some trial maltings. Uh, when they narrowed it down to about half a dozen varieties, we got to do a trial malting on each of those and presented them with some flavor uh, data. And 
it was really great because two of the final four had fantastic flavor and uh, just malted very easily. And, you know, they selected this variety and named it Avalon. Um, <laughs> and so and to follow, just to follow that thread through, so you're standing on a, maybe a 10 by 50 uh, foot uh, variety plot uh, in their variety trials. And the next step is what they call breeder seed. They make the plots a little bigger. And then they take it to a certified seed program to scale it up for commercial production. So even when it left the research world, we still had another couple of years for it to get commercial levels of seed. So this year will be an early uh, access point for us. Maybe we'll get a couple of truckloads, something like that. Um, and then our hope is, you know, it'll be commercial scale availability at the 2023 harvest. But very excited about this variety. Um, it, it's, it, you know, we climate change is happening, and uh, this this variety has weathered a a, a pretty wild uh, decade of of ex extreme rain, drought, uh, all sorts of different climatic uh, stressors during these trials. So we're we're optimistic that this barley can lead us uh, deep into the next decade. Well, wow, that's great. Hey, um, talking about the craft malt week that's coming up, September 11th to 17th, sure. you know, you talk about converts to craft malt. So are, are you kind of a proselytizer? I know that um, there's a, a a story you guys posted on Instagram. There's a, a farm, farming couple in the Netherlands that met you <laughs> at one of the conferences. You want to yeah. tell us about them? Because I, I love that story. <laughs> so do I. It, it's uh, you, you know, it, I always love when that when those stories come back around um, because you know I, I just feel like you know, especially at the conferences and things like that, I just roll out of bed and just start talking about craft malt to anybody who's within <laughs> ten feet of me. And uh, you know, th these folks, it was really exciting to see them. You know, join the guild. Learn, you know, actually take advantage of the educational resources that we provide our members and then translate that education to uh, action and actually start producing beautiful craft malt from barley grown on their farm. And uh, it was cool. I actually went to their, their Instagram feed and looked at this beautiful little contraption that they built to turn the floor malt. And I was immediately like, well, I want one of those. Like <laughs> that looks super cool. And uh, and then I go through some more, and they have like this beautiful little like miniature. Um, uh, what would I call it? Like a skid steer kind of a thing that scoops the barley up off the floor without shovels. And I'm like, damn it, they figured it out. Like this little contraption is way more efficient than having two or three people shoveling malt off the floor. You know. They did it. So I love that kind of thing, you know, where you know, we give them a little, give folks, you know, that are enterprising uh, entrepreneurs, you give them a little, fan that flame just a little bit, and then you turn around in a couple of years and they built a better mousetrap, you know? It's awesome. Oh, that's great. That's a great story. I'm going to ask a serious question because, you know, I, I see how these industries evolve. I, I think when I, early days are talking about whether it was barley or hops, I know in New York there was like crop insurance. Well, yes. that, you know, now that you're growing, who is funding craft malt? And when did it become fundable? That that's my question. You mean from an investor standpoint? Investor, bank, credit, I mean, you know, trust of of your, others in your industry. Yeah, you know, I, I think where craft malt really has, has found a home is, you know, as people are looking for environmentally conscious businesses to support, we fit in really beautifully because it's such a clear storyline of, you know, let's say, let's put air quotes around fixing a problem of moving grain from one side of the country or one side of the world to a brewery that's nested in, in a given investor's backyard. And now all of a sudden you're saying that one of the key ingredients in that beer can also come from their backyard. And, and they, that, that story is, 
really resonating right now as a, a you know, it, is it as sexy as, you know, some sort of financial technology software that can be replicated and spun up into a, a thousand percent year over year growth? It's tough to compete with that, you know. It, we're still, you know, I always tell people whenever we talk uh, to inv potential investors, it's like, um, let me be very clear. We do not make widgets here. This is an agricultural product and beer is an agricultural product. And we can do everything right and Mother Nature can still throw us a curveball. But here's what we've done to mitigate risk across a lot of different channels to make sure that we always have a steady pipeline of, of um raw materials that are high quality, you know? So I, I think it's really that sort of environmentally conscious, uh, sustainability focused in, in investor group that that's growing steadily, that that's, that's supportive of, of this industry. Uh, thank, thank you. That's a great answer. A couple more questions. Um, when we first were talking before the show, you mentioned supply chain um, and opportunities. Yeah. So we hear about, you know, there's wars, there's grain supplies being disrupted, you know, transportation issues. So what is the supply chain opportunity and, and what do you want to say about it? Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's, um, it, it, as I mentioned, when you and I were chatting uh, before we started recording, you, you know, I think a lot of our customers kind of looked at me like I was full of it when I, uh, I would talk about like, oh, well, you know, we, we offer an alternative to, you know, any sort of supply chain hiccups and stuff like that. And they would always kind of be like, what supply chain hookups, uh, uh, hiccup, hiccups? I call, I put in my order with the big suppliers and it arrives in a couple of days and we're all good. And, you know, that's fine. That's when the system was working perfectly. But now that we have, you know, a, right now, glo global commodities, including grain and everything else, is stuck in shipping containers, moving in different loops and directions at triple the cost that it was three to four years ago. And uh, there's some geopolitical things that are changing, you know, who's growing grain and who's buying it and all of that. All of that is tied up and creates heartburn for small scale breweries. And, you know, Intercraft Malt, who by definition is regionally sourcing and regionally shipping, in some cases handling shipping in house uh, with their own box truck or flatbed or whatever, and all of a sudden that that heartburn goes away when you can call. I mean, I have customers that call and text daily, and they're just like, it's it's a ten word text. Hey Brent, can I have a pallet of Southern Select? I say, I've got you covered. The wheels are in motion. It'll be there Thursday. And that's the sum total of their experience, you know. It's, and, every, it, it, and that, I think, is, unfortunately, it, it took a, a transportation meltdown uh, occurring over months and months, coupled with some pretty low-quality material being harvested out of Europe and Western U.S. Uh, in 2021, all those converging factors really opened up a lot of people's eyes to, to what the value of going local means. Well, that's a great one, man. Thank you. I feel better about the world already. <laughs> I know. I, 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 it, it's the same for me with food and everything. You know, it's like I, I want an egg that's from, from nearby and it's always hard to translate it to, uh, you know, to use it in a, a restaurant or commercial operation. But more and more, we're yeah. seeing all those networks rise up last one about again about going back to farmers and the last question i'm supposed to ask you because it is sure. important um you've got your slogan is malt with a mission what is that and how does that relate to uh local farms yeah so it, it started off uh, you know again it, it was just making that connection to you know we saw at the time craft beer in north carolina was on pace to be a billion dollar industry every year. And when we when we really looked at how the industry was structured, the farmer was completely shut out of that industry because of the lack of infrastructure between the field and the fermenter. And so Malt with a Mission was born with the goal of connecting those two dots. And, you know, it, it meant figuring out you know, talking to Ag Extension about the best way to grow grain, 
finding seed cleaners and trucking companies that could take care of the grain and get it to us in good condition. And then us learning how to make world-class malt over the last decade uh, to really be that final step on the way to the brew house. And uh, it, it's, you know, it's been great. We, we've connected with farmers. Uh, in some cases, we're, in most cases, we're a second, if not a third paycheck for them uh, because we're buying winter grain. So we're not com uh, competing with the traditional corn and soybeans that grow in the summer. Um, you know, you get some environmental benefits from doing uh, the cover cropping that comes with an off-season crop. And, you know, we're, we're just really proud to have helped growers connect with, I mean, now craft beer is a billion dollar industry just in Western North Carolina alone. I mean, and, and close to 2 billion, I think across the state. So, and that's just North Carolina. That's not even talking about Tennessee, Virginia, and the rest of the, uh, Florida has been huge for us as well. So it, it's just been crazy to, to make these connections across the Southeast. Wow, Brent, this is a great talking to you one-on-one, -on -one, a real treat for me. And, uh, Thanks to your team for setting it up. Yeah, you appreciate it. Just thank, thank you, Brent. And thanks to our team, uh, Armin Spengen, engineer, and Alex Tran, producing intern. I'm Jimmy Carboni. We'll catch you next time on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. Woo, thank you. Beer Sessions Radio is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.